Hi, welcome to More Orthodoxy. This is the channel for Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox alike. Uh, today I'm joined by Catherine Burbelsing. Catherine is a British education reformer and a head teacher. She's the founder and headmistress of Michaela Community School, a free school or a charter school established in 2014 in Wembley Park in London. Catherine is the author of To Miss with Love, an editor of Battle Hymn of the Tiger Teachers, The Michaela Way, and more recently, Michaela, The Power of Culture. She also hosts a blog, To Miss with Love, where she writes about the education system. In 2017, she was in included by Anthony Seldon in his list of the 20 most influential for degrees in British education. And in 2019, she was awarded the Contrarian Prize, which I think is fantastic and testament to the fact that she's doing something right, to be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to start off then, Catherine, could you tell us a bit about your background and perhaps some of the key events and movements in your life that have helped form who you are? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I grew up for the main part in Canada. Uh, my parents from the Caribbean. My mom's Jamaican, my father's Guyanese. Um, and uh, they in the 60s, which was very common, West Indians came to London uh, because it was the mother country and it was the country that you know, all West Indians wanted to go to. So they spent some years here in Britain and then they moved to Canada. And I grew up, as I say, for the most part there, but uh, came here at the age of 15 and have been here ever since. Um, my father is a great lover of cricket. Uh, in the 80s, the West Indies used to beat uh, England, uh, you know, constantly and very badly. And um, <laughs> I think it was, a, it was a really interesting relationship um, because, you know, I think in the 80s, uh, England was a difficult place for uh, many black people. You know, I mean, my, when my father, well, I mean, in the 60s, when my father first arrived, you know, he'd be looking for a room to live in and, you know, you'd find the no Irish, no colored, no dogs in the, in the windows and so on. So with it, through cricket you know um there was a real sense of achievement when uh, the west indies would beat england you know? <laughs> so um uh yeah i that i was explaining my father there and so um i came here at the age of 15 with my parents and then um i've been here ever since i went to oxford university i did uh, french and philosophy and um and i've always been a teacher um and i've always worked in the inner city and uh and i chose to work in the inner city because I, I really wanted to teach underprivileged kids who wouldn't perhaps otherwise have the opportunity. Um, I say otherwise. I mean, what I mean is I, I, I wanted to give something back to them and I wanted to uh, make it so that they might have the same opportunities that I've kind of had, you know, to get to Oxford or, 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 or do anything they want, really. So, um, and I've been doing that now for over 20 years. Having said that, um, in 2010, I gave a speech at the uh, Conservative Party conference uh, where I uh, told everyone I thought the education system was broken and I explained why. And that got me into a lot of hot water and I ended up without a job. And then I was told I'd never get a job in the state sector again. And, um, and that was a very distressing time, really, because uh, all I'd ever known was teaching and and um, the inner city and the kids who I loved. I mean, if, if, you know, you know, any of my friends, they would all say, you know, when I was in my twenties and my friends were becoming bankers and lawyers and so on, and they were all earning much more money than me. And they'd all say, you know, what are you doing, Catherine? And I'd say, well, because, you know, when I talk about my job and why I loved it. And they'd all say, well, you know what? You might not earn as much money as us, but you're certainly the happiest of us because I just loved my job. So in 2010 to lose my uh, career and to be told that because of the views I held uh, that that was unacceptable essentially, um, that uh, to work in the state sector, uh, I was told I should go to the private sector. I did visit a couple of private schools and thought about working in the private sector, but you know, I love underprivileged kids and it's what I do best. And I, I don't have anything against the private sector. I wish them well and it's great that they teach what they do and that, that's great, you know. But my skills and my love is for the kind of children that we find here at our school at Michaela. So uh, I then decided I had to set up my own school. Uh, it took us three years to open Michaela, um, but uh, we have managed it. We got opened in 2014 and um, we've now been around for six years. And in September, actually, we'll finally be full with all of the kids because every year you take in more children. And um, we got some great GCSE results last year. And um, our detractors have finally gone away. You know, a lot of people <laughs> tried to stop us from opening what we've, what we've got there. And I feel like we're, we're kind of safe now. Um, and we've also just done things very differently at the school because um, I suppose I'm quite radical on the things that I think in education. And um, 
we've managed to implement uh, a lot of these things here at the school. And uh, I, I do feel there's a bit of a revolution going on in, in education. So there are other people who think like me and all of us, you know, I would say we, we all have a role to play in this revolution. In a hundred years, people will look back to this time, I think, and really mark it out as, 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 as an extraordinary time in education. Mm, marvelous. And I'm, and I'm really humbled and, you know, uh, and thrilled to be part of that revolution. Marvellous, thank you, Catherine. So um, you mentioned your parents there. Are there any other persons that have had an especially inspirational or important role in your life that you'd like to tell us about? Um, well, it's really my, my parents. My father, you know, my father grew up without any shoes. You know, he was very, very poor family in Guyana. Um, you know, the, the eight brothers and sisters, uh, nothing. You know, they just had nothing. And then um, they managed to uh, get him to what was considered the best school in Georgetown, Guyana. And then eventually he went off to the University of the West Indies in, in Kingston, Jamaica, which is where he met my mother. And then they, they came to England. And, um, and they have a real um, you know, immigrant story of uh, w working through hardship uh, and doing everything they could for their children. You know, my, my parents, I always remember us not being very wealthy. And I remember, and one of the reasons why we, it wasn't that we were dirt poor, but um, my mother was a nurse. My father was a university lecturer. So we weren't dirt poor. But, but the reason why we felt dirt poor was because my father spent most of his time and money uh, sponsoring his family to come to Toronto and bringing those uh, seven brothers and sisters and their families. And so our house was always filled with um, uh, cousins and uncles and aunts who he was trying to establish and then he'd pay for their rent you know to go into an apartment and get them set up you know so I had lots of cousins who worked at McDonald's and various you know cleaning jobs and that sort of thing where we would bring them and we would try and help them to try and you know have a better life you know and 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 so my parents really represent that story of the, of the immigrant who um, my father was all about his children and um and he he, he did whatever he could to, 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 to make sure that we would succeed. And education was important to him. Books were important to him. And, um, and he really tried to instill in us this idea of working hard. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what they throw at you. And it, it doesn't matter if you know, the system you know, is, is, is difficult, obstacles and racism and all that sort of thing. It doesn't matter. Uh, you just need to pick yourself up and keep going. So, um, yeah, it, it was watching my parents do that over and over again um, in circumstances which are perhaps far more difficult than my circumstances. I remember when, um, because I did French and philosophy, I, I lived in uh, Paris for a year and, um, and I was in a, what they call it in Chambre de Bonne, so a maid's room up at the top of the buildings, the Paris buildings, right at the top you have these little rooms mm -hmm. and the rooms are sort of attached well, they used to be attached to the, to the apartments below. And that was where your maid might live. And um, they're normally a bit grubby and horrible and there's no bathroom or anything. And you might share a toilet with uh, 10 other people up there and the toilet was grotesque. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and I was uh, complaining and saying how, you know, all I had was a, was a fridge and I had a little hot plate, you know, and that was all I had to, to be able to cook. And, you know, and my father said, well, you know, at least you've got a fridge. You know, when I was your age, I used to have to put the fridge on the windowsill outside um, to keep it cold. And in the summer, well, I just didn't have any milk because there was no way of keeping it cold because I couldn't afford a fridge. So, you know, my father always um, made sure to remind me just how lucky I was to have the advantages I had. And I only had all of the advantages that I had, which were plentiful, thanks to my parents. I remember when I was little, you know, they, they signed us up for, me and my sister, we, they signed us up for gymnastics lessons and ballet lessons and, and piano lessons. And they didn't really know much about this stuff, but they just knew that we've got to get them to go to extracurricular lessons because that's what good parents do. And, and, and they would scrape, you know, put aside the money to be able to pay for that. And um, they sacrificed in so many ways. My mother never bought herself any new clothes. My father still wears the last 30 years he's been wearing the same winter coat and the, the canadian win winters are, are very cold <laughs> he they they sacrificed everything for their children and and it's so ingrained in them now that they're no longer supporting their children and so on they still scrimp and save because that's just so built into who they are you know and um 
there, I think there's something really wonderful about that when a family pulls together in mm. order to do what is best for their children, because it means then that the child is grateful to their parents and the child wants to pay back their parent in some way. And um, I just think that's the cycle of life. It's how things should be really for everyone. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for that, Catherine. So uh, in your book, you also mentioned the real life Michaela. I was just wondering about her. Can you tell us, about, tell us a bit about her? And um, I loved how you spoke of her value for order, for example, kind of a naughty word in our profession, it seems, for many people. Um, would you like to speak on that a little bit? Yeah, well, um, Michaela, very similar in that sense. You know, she came from St. Lucia. She'd originally come, she was born in St. Lucia and, come, and came here as a small child. And um, she was my second in charge uh, at one of my schools. I was head of languages and she was head of Spanish. Um, and she was older than me and so humble. I remember when I first started, I was slightly worried about, you know, taking over and she'd been acting head of a department and I didn't know how that would go down. She didn't care. She was more than happy for me to do that. And <clears throat> she was more than happy because she's one of those teachers who wants to teach. She doesn't want to climb up the pole, you know, for leadership. And um, I think too often in our profession, people like them, like Michaela, are not recognized because she was an amazing teacher and loved the children and believed in rigor and high standards of discipline. And if only she were alive now, sadly, she died in 2011 of cancer, which is why we named the, the school after her. And, um, you know, if she were alive now, she would love the school. She would love everything about it. I mean, and, and we named it after her because she didn't know of, you know, there are lots of people who love Michaela, who love Edie Hirsch and they love Dan Willingham and they love all of the kind of research that's out there on education and what works. Well, Michaela never read any of this research. <laughs> Michaela was just old fashioned and old school and she believed in children being children and in adults being adults. And um, she was able to command her classroom and inspire those children. And so it made sense really to name the school after her because we live and breathe everything she believed in. Wonderful. Um, let's just take a few, uh, a look at a few, a few of your books and motifs if we may. Um, so in To Mess With Love, I was wondering what sparked this book and maybe you could tell us about um, some of the events and characters that you mentioned in the book that you think that have left an indelible impact on you. Yeah, well, I mean, all the kids I've taught, all, you know, <laughs> keep them with you, don't you? And then what is really lovely now, actually, because I'm more in the news and stuff, every now and again, a child who I used to teach, I say child, you know, they're 35 years old. <laughs> they, they write and they say, oh miss do you remember me you taught me french and um you used to do breakfast club on a friday morning we eat croissants together and so on so it's really nice you know they, they they find me and i mean it's just lovely and um and it's particularly lovely because you find out what they're doing and so on and, and and they say things like you had such an impact on my life and of course that's why all of us teachers why do we do what we do to have impact on these children so those characters and to miss with love yeah i mean um you know, they bring a smile to my face. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I often wonder about certain ones, you know, what's happened to the one, not just them. I mean, all of the children I've taught, I, and all teachers must think like this. They must always think, I wonder what happened to so-and-so, and I wonder what's happened, where do they go? Because you put everything into these children for years, and you give them so much of your love and your energy and your time, and then they go. And, <laughs> You know, and, 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 and some of them you never hear from again. In fact, most of them you never hear from again because unless you run into them, you know, and, and, and you sort of wonder, well, what, what, what ha whatever happened to them? So I don't know what's happened to those children. Um, well, one of them, I think I called him Dopey in the, um, in the <laughs> book. Um, one of them I ran into maybe a few years later and he said to me that he got on a football course and he was really excited. Although, you know, I, then I sort of think, well, yeah, but what happens next after that football course? I don't know because... Mm -hmm. um, you know, he'd ended up with a C in French and um, he, uh, and I was so happy about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that that C in, in his French GCSE was the only C he had. So uh, ultimately, you know, I look at Dopey and I think, gosh, we really failed him. You know, the system failed him. And what does that mean for his life? And what I'm so happy about is that while then I was thrilled because I was able to get Dopey a C in his French, I'm now able to have impact on, a, on, a, on hundreds of children and enable them to get uh, the, the kinds of results that they ought to get to fulfill their potential so that everyone at, at Michaela's, well, the vast majority, I can't say all of them because not all of them, you know, we get 90% getting English and their English and their maths. But the ones who don't, 
It's not because there was chaos in their classrooms. It's not because they didn't work hard. It's because cognitively, it, w it really is very hard for them to get that, that, that C or the four that we call them now. Um, so the key thing is for a child to reach their potential. And I think there's too much potential in our schools um, that, that's being wasted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that that sort of comes across in Battle Hymn of the Tiger Teachers too, the Michaela Way, how you have impressed upon your fellow teachers. Um, I was just going to say that this book sort of speaks to many of the virtues that mark your own life as well. And um, it's kind of distinct. It shows how Michaela teachers do actually think differently. This was from a lot of what we're taught there, how yes. to think as teachers, um, especially in the state sector, as mm -hmm. it were. Um, what are a few of the ideas that have become sort of standard practice in English schools, which you find most harmful? And um, what are some of the things at Michaela that you offer in its stead? Yeah. Uh, so you've mentioned our books. I mean, we've, got, we've written two books, and I say we because it's the teachers at Michaela who have uh, contributed the chapters in the books. There's the first one, which is the Battle Hymn of the Tiger Teachers, and the second one, which just come out a couple of weeks ago, called The Power of Culture. And the reason why we've written these books is because we hope to have impact on the wider education sphere. And I know we already have, um, just because we get about 600 visitors a year visiting the school, and um, they tend to be mainly teachers mainly from uh, uh, Britain, but actually from all over the world as well. And they come because they hear about us through social media or they read the book or whatever the reason, mm -hmm. and they're inspired. And then I hear back from them and they tell me how they've implemented these ideas in their classrooms or in their schools, if it's a head teacher, and how things have changed for the better. Also, it's not just about the strategies, it's also just about a mindset and changing their way of seeing things. So I feel, um, we are having that impact, which, which, which is great. Um, in terms of things that um, elsewhere, well, a big one is authority, a general sense of authority. So I think in schools where they allow too much um, authority to the child and they don't hold the authority uh, as the teacher, I think that can be highly problematic. So people might say, well, what do you mean by that? So when you have um, students, uh, student uh, councils or student uh, leaders, on a panel to decide who should be deputy head. Um, I don't think there should be. You know, I think it's a bit silly. You know, a 12 year old doesn't know what makes for a good head deputy head. Frankly, many teachers don't necessarily know what makes for a good deputy head. Um, so, you know, the idea that a 14 year old would know this, uh, it's so undermining of our profession and of what we are capable of. You know, we've got degrees, we've got years of experience, and yet we often think, oh, but the children know just as much as we do. Well, they don't. I mean, it's absurd. Can you imagine a doctor saying, well, you know, let, let me, the 12 year old, <laughs> tell me how to do this surgery because he knows as much as I do. It's absurd. And yet we all do it. We don't think anything of it. And um, I think this is highly undermining uh, for the school and for the child because the child does not expect to be leading. The child expects to be led. And that is because we know more. If I'm a junior doctor in a hospital, I expect the senior doctor to leave me and to show me what to do. Well, it's very similar here. Um, and, and they're children, all the more so, you know. But I say that and people think, oh, well, you know, that's silly. Obviously children can lead themselves. They cannot lead themselves, they are children. And I believe very much that we let them down when we don't lead them. So that whole notion of authority, uh, can can undermine a school so the teacher doesn't feel that she can hand out detentions and demerits um you know with consistency because she feels a bit awkward at the end of the day you know uh the children are sort of like her and you know she has to sort of win them round. and there is an element of truth to that in that relationships are very important and you want to win the children round, and you want the children to understand why we have a praise and punishment system and you want the children to understand that you're on their side but on the other hand you must embrace that sense of authority and follow on through with that and that means dishing out punishments when necessary and also giving them praise because if you don't uh really hold on and, and value that position of authority your praise becomes meaningless it really does you give your praise and they think well who are you you could be my friend and if you're my friend well you know why don't i just get my friend to tell me i'm brilliant or worse still you've given praise to everybody because you've given a certificate to everyone and so actually the certificate doesn't mean anything yeah. and the kids know it the kids aren't stupid so you you've got to be real with them and um i think too often our rejection of traditional values uh that 
one would have found in schools, you know, everywhere, 50, 60 years ago, it would have been normal. Nowadays, it's quite radical to try and, um, and, 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 and bring those traditional values back. Mm, marvelous, thank you, Catherine. So, um, which methods prove most controversial, especially vis-a-vis -vis the your goal to improve the lives of people from particularly disadvantaged backgrounds? And then you got the whole issue of race now taking center stage increasingly, I guess. Yeah, it... well, I think the behavior uh, it tends to be the thing that people dislike most. Although they also dislike the teaching methods, they don't like the behavior because we say that there are no excuses. Um, well, it's not entirely true when we say no excuses. There is the occasional excuse. When I say the occasional excuse for a child who hasn't done his homework, for instance, in a, in a some excuses school, some children come in without their homework done and the teachers say, well, he's black, he's poor, I get it. He doesn't really have a desk to work at at home. I'm going to let him go on this one. Um, you know, one of my new teachers is coming here. She was just telling me yesterday about how She's not allowed to, over this COVID period, she hasn't been allowed to insist that the children do their work on paper because the teachers say, well, we're not sure they can afford paper. You know, meanwhile, they all have a mobile phone, but they can't afford paper. <laughs> so there are these inventions of what actually is real. You know, yeah. these children can afford to get paper and um, they could do their work. But because their teacher lowers their expectations of the child, the child then doesn't do their work and that's to help the child. So uh, that's a big thing. They, they, they don't like the fact that we say, no, everyone has to get their paper. Everyone has to do detention if they get a detention. If you don't do your homework, you get a detention. And that's the case for everyone. Now, when I say it's not entirely true, every now and again, there might be, so I think about a boy of ours whose mother died um, suddenly, and it was awful. And um, he didn't do his homework. I decided to let it go. That decision came from me. There's no way his teacher would have made that decision. It had to come to me. So when an exception is made for any of our rules, it is always me that decides them. And that means it doesn't happen very often, because otherwise I'd be running off my head, you know, I, I'm the only person making these decisions. But the point is that it's not just up to anybody in the, in the, in the school, because otherwise what happens is that some teachers are really become quite lax and lenient. They allow all sorts of kids to get off with whatever, and other teachers who are a lot more strict. And that inconsistency across the school is just poison. Okay, when you, you, the thing that makes a school successful is having consistency. Well, there's lots of things, but that I'd say is one of the main things. And um, if you are busy allowing teachers to just do anything, well, then you get loads of inconsistency and children thrive in predictable, consistent environments. You know, when all the desks are in rows and it's like that in every classroom, they know what to expect. Mm -hmm. When all the behavior systems, there's one centralized behavior system and the children know that in every room, it's merits, demerits, one demerit means a uh, warning, two demerits means a detention, three demerits means I'm out. And that happens in every classroom, especially for those children who are a little bit more, you know, they're not able to uh, follow along so well with things. Uh, you know, they're not as bright as their, their peers. They, um, Imagine, they have to keep in their heads, in their nine different classrooms, or 10 different classrooms, there are all these different rules. Their miss is really strict, but sir isn't so strict. And there's that behavior system here, and he does points, and he does merits, and he doesn't do anything at all. And in this room, I have a horseshoe to sit around. That room, I've got group desks. And in this room, I've got, I've got uh, desks and rows. And in this room, I can talk, and it's okay. But in that room, I get a detention if I talk. I mean, it's utterly, even forget about how bright they are. It's absolutely confusing for everybody. I mean, so, and then of course they don't follow it. And of course they get confused. Whereas if you have consistency, you are supporting and scaffolding your children so that they're more likely to get it right. And it's the same with their learning. So that's a big thing people don't like. You might think, well, why don't they like it? It sounds great. I mean, <clears throat> they don't like it because they think we're being mean. They think that I'm on some kind of power trip, that I love giving out detention. So the fact of the matter is, I don't give out a single, I don't think I've ever given out a single detention at Michaela. I mean, I'm the head. So, you know, I, what kind of power trip am I on? I'm, 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 I'm creating an environment where my teachers are able to teach. And then the other thing they don't like are our teaching methods. So they don't like our teaching methods because they feel that um, we're stifling creativity is what they would say. And that the children are unable to um, uh, develop their own views. What I always say is come and meet our kids because I have never met such forthright, opinionated people in my life. Right? They, and not only that, but because they're so knowledgeable, because they're taught so well, 
their opinions actually matter and mean something. And then they get really interested in a topic because, well, they know something about it and knowledge begets knowledge. And so they keep going and keep going. And so, you know, I don't dare talk to our kids about history because they know more about it than I do. I mean, I'm not making that up. I'm being really serious. The fact is that they are really, really good because the lessons are really good. And that means they have great opinions and they are super creative. And sadly, in our education system, people think that to make children creative, you just kind of leave them to it and give them absolute freedom. No, it's precisely by, by, by structuring and scaffolding their learning, as I was just talking about, yeah. that they can then feel successful. And it's the same with the behavior, you scaffold the behavior, you scaffold the learning, and then they can behave and they can succeed. And then they want to do more. And then they're really excited. So teachers come here and they say, how come your children all have their hands up? How come they're so interested in learning? I've never seen such curiosity from children before. And I would agree with them. I've never seen it before either. When I think back to that book, To Miss With Love, gosh, I mean, the kids here are nothing to do. They're completely different to those kids. And when I say completely different, they're from the same kinds of backgrounds. This is all still inner city London, right? There's no difference between those kids in To Miss With Love and the kids that we've got here. But we've just trained them differently. We've got a different environment. We're all trained differently. Because people might say, train a child. What do you mean, train a child? Yeah, we're all being trained all of the time, even me. So being at Michaela makes me into a better person. Um, I have higher standards for myself. I expect more. And that is the case for all of the teachers here and all of the children. And how great to be part of an environment that lifts you up every day. Mm, beautiful. I think uh, very much in line with what you're just saying there, one major fault that I find also in progressive education is the lack of est establishing those firm foundations. So whenever they do speak of thinking critically, um, they really mean questioning everything, apart from their own uh, presupposed ideology, that is, um, without yeah. having, say, those logical foundations that you're speaking to, uh, yeah. or building um, up the knowledge of grammar and working on memorization and so forth, like yeah. you do, or like um, they do with the classical education. How do you teach uh, pupils to remember a uh, long term rather than forget, uh, kind of contra the more popular progressive model? that um, yeah. it becomes embedded in their kind of knowledge, I guess. Yeah, so, and, and that's a key point because you say the progressive model, but the progressive model doesn't have memory as its focus. <laughs> uh, and, and we need to remember that if children are not remembering what they're being taught, well, what was the point of teaching them? Mm. I mean, the whole point is you're meant to be able to remember it. Now, um, that doesn't mean, and the reason why people don't is because they think that means rote learning. You sit there like a parrot, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> no. Look, some things need to be wrote learned. Your times tables need to be wrote learned. Your history dates need to be wrote learned. But not everything is wrote learned. You, one, you need some wrote learning to have the basis so you understand. Then you also need to be told stuff. Now, I know that sounds odd. What do you mean being told stuff? Obviously all teachers tell. No, they don't. Uh, they tend to play this game, guess what's in my head. So they say, um, no, does anyone know, um, the name of the school. Anyone? Anyone? Now, of course, these children don't know the name of the school because you haven't told them. They couldn't possibly know. And then, so yes, hand over here. What is it? And then they make a guess because they're guessing what's in your head. No, no, no. Nearly, nearly. Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> Why don't you just say, look, the name's Michaela. There we go. Okay. I've told you what it is. It took me about two seconds instead of wasting the five, ten minutes of what I just did. Yeah. Because eventually you would go, no, I don't think anyone's got it. It's called Michaela. And what you have done, it's worse than just wasting time because you've made everybody feel stupid. <laughs> Everyone sitting there thinks, oh my goodness, I'm so dumb. Now, what's even worse is that often what happens is you ask them a question that little Amy at the front knows the answer. And the reason why she knows the answer is because her mother and father every evening sit around the dinner table together and talk about the politics of the day, which involves mentioning bits of geography and science and you know English and so on. And so Amy knows some of this stuff. And so when the teacher asks the question that she hasn't actually taught the answer yet to the, to the, to the class, Amy goes, me, 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 me. And little Johnny at the back thinks, gosh, well, I'm not very clever, am I? Um, he doesn't think, oh, well, I'm from a different socioeconomic background. And so that's why uh, Amy knows the answer. Now, had the teacher taught everybody the answer, then Johnny has an equal chance. But as it is, the teacher plays guess what's in my head because the teacher mistakenly believes that she is um, somehow making them think <laughs> and that she's making them be creative. When in fact, 
She's making Johnny feel stupid. So that the next lesson, he starts whacking David. He gets sent out of the class, which means he's further behind, further behind. Then he gets the label of SEN. Then he fails his GCSEs and everyone says, well, Johnny just wasn't that bright. Well, actually, Johnny could have been bright had his teacher taught him, but she didn't teach him because she thought she was making him creative by not giving him the answer. And that is that, that if, if, if your listeners could just take away that one point that I've made there and check and watch themselves, because the thing is, it's so ingrained in our heads playing that game that um, it's quite hard to get out of the habit. So you, you've got to watch yourself when you're teaching. And if you catch yourself asking them a question where you haven't taught them the answer, okay? If you haven't already taught them, then the problem is that people think that th telling them the answer is cheating. And they don't understand that it, that's what it is teaching. It's not cheating, it's teaching. <laughs> and that is what it is to teach, to tell them the answer. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't come back to it three days later and say, anybody remember the name of the school? Uh, uh, oh, I see a lot of hands, I see a lot of hands. Why am I not seeing everybody? And then you come back to it three days after that and then you get a whole full room of hands. Now you've got it because it's your role as a teacher, not just to tell them the stuff, but to test them on the stuff and to check what the understanding that you know that they've got it so that you know whether or not you need to reteach it. Mm -hmm. um, now in all amongst that, you then also want them, I always say doing this with the knowledge. You don't just give them knowledge and then that's it. They've got to do something with it. So we do turn to your partner where they turn 30 seconds, go. And they go rah, 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 to each other, back, hands up, right? Let me hear the answers. And they put their hands up and then you check to see everyone's had the chance to express the answer to each other. Um, now let's do a couple of sentences, go. Rah, 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 rah. You're writing it down. Right, up again, let's have a class discussion. So you are in different ways, class discussion, turn to your partner, writing stuff down, doing homework. All of these ways are methods to make sure that it is committed to memory. And the teacher is constantly testing herself to see, have they got it? Comes back to it six weeks later, have they got it? Because if they haven't got it, well, you haven't done your job as a teacher. Marvelous. I think um, most of progressive education was based around some of these kind of questionable philosophical foundations. So um, there's all this focus on disembodied values that are kind of merely arbitrary in a lot of cases. And um, I think you, you and your colleagues critique some of these uh, notions and methods uh, very well. Um, I'm thinking, what are some of the most warped ideas that have trickled down? So in one of the books, I believe they mentioned Rousseau and this whole notion of uh, man is born free and everywhere in chains, which sort of speaks to your previous point about uh, the way it's structured, the, mm -hmm. our model of teaching is structured for the most part. So people think that these are um, just abstract philosophical ideas that have no brain on everyday life or real life, as it were. Do you think, can you think of any others that um, you think are particularly pernicious and that you run up against? Well, I mean, I think I've already spoken about them. I mean, yeah. There's one, the Rousseau, so just to explain to your audience, the Rousseau idea, which is that um, instead of us putting something into the child, whether you're their parent or their teacher, it could be either, the idea is that you're drawing it out of them. I mean, I don't understand how you sit in front of, you know, you stand in front of a four-year-old and you say, is this a square or is this a triangle? <laughs> which one's a square, which one's a triangle? Well, how are they meant to know? I mean, you have to tell them, it's absurd. I mean, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't, it's mad. I mean, and I say it's mad. Rousseau believed that you were drawing it out of them. It's a very romantic idea. Uh, that is not the role of the teacher. The role of the teacher is to put lots of stuff in them. Now, once they've got lots of stuff in them, well, then you could draw it out. <laughs> but you've got to put it into them first. And the fact of the matter is that if you haven't put it in them and you are able to draw it out, then somebody else put it there. You just you got to remember, right? If you didn't put it there, somebody else did. And it was probably their parents. And that is why the middle class children are doing well and the working class children not so well. And it's not because the working class children aren't so clever, they're just as clever. It's just that they haven't had the knowledge put inside them. And that we are depending on the parents who are doing it for us. It is our role as teachers to try and make sure that the disadvantaged children in the, in the classroom have just as much opportunity as the ones who uh, come from you know, richer backgrounds. And um, you know, I don't see that. I, I, I know lots of teachers have that ambition but because of the poor teaching methods that we've all been taught, it's no one's fault. The PGCEs, the, the training, all of it is wrong. It tells us to do all the wrong stuff. Um, when our staff join here, we have to 
undo all of the stuff that they've done before and we have to teach them how to, to teach in a Michaela way. Um, so you need to sort of recognize that as a teacher and think, you know what, I've been doing this wrong for the last two years, five years, 25 years, and I'm going to change my teaching methods. But that takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of courage. And um, well, I suppose not everyone is willing to do that. I think too um, that the directionless belief in progress, as it were, is a key problem. Um, I think when, in one of the books too, you mentioned about C there's a C.S. Lewis quote in your office. Yeah. And um, yeah. can you tell us a bit about that and what true progress means? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's, it's right here. Um, <laughs> actually, can I get it? I'll come. Yeah, I'll sure. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So there's the quote. It was given to me by um, one of my teachers. Wow. And it says, we all want progress, but progress means getting nearer to the place where you want to be. And if you have taken a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer, right? Because you've taken a wrong turning. And that's the point that, I was just, that you were just saying, you know, mm -hmm. or what we were just saying, you know, you're, you're teaching in a way that isn't actually getting the best out of the kids. And so going, keep, to keep going that way, it doesn't get you any nearer. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive man. Now, um, yeah, uh, I mean, life is, is, is all about that, really, I'd say. You know, what I mean by that is in anything that you do, there will be many times where you have to pause and stop and think, Am I going down the right route here? Or do I need to go back 10 meters and take a different turn uh, so that I can get to where my end goal is? And so my senior team at Michaela, we meet every morning at 7 a.m. for exactly that reason. And we're constantly going through stuff and we're changing our minds about stuff. Yeah, we tried that last week, not working. Let's change our minds, you know, and we're developing. So even though we are now about to start our seventh year, we still haven't got to the point where we're finished with uh, the systems, creating the systems and embedding them. We still haven't got to the point where I can give you a kind of blueprint to say, this is how you do a Michaela school. I, I, it, hasn't, it isn't finished. And, um, you know, the way I was just speaking to uh, one of my staff who's, um, she's in charge of uh, what we call newbies, our new staff. And I was saying, look, we, we need a blueprint of how we induct our staff and what we offer them and how we do that. And, and, and we've been obviously been inducting staff for, for six years. So it's not a question of not having done it, but I now want us to move us to the next level where we have something that's very similar every year where we're doing the same thing. Now we've been developing that over years. So um, we, and, and in developing that, we found, oh, we tried that, didn't work. Let's do something different. Oh, we have to go back 10 meters and do take a different road and so on. Uh, and, and we do that all the time here at Michaela. I think people often think that, you know, I mean, I don't know, they must think I'm some kind of weird genius, really, because they imagine that I had this idea of the school and it was going to do X, Y, and Z, and then I made it just happen and it did exactly what I thought it was going to do from the beginning. I mean, I, I'd have to be some kind of genius. I mean, and I really am not. Many of the ideas here are from the teachers who work here. Um, and they have changed over time. And in fact, that's why we came out with the second book, uh, because there was so much that we never said in the first book. And also there were things that frankly, I feel we got wrong. And so there's things in the first book where I think, oh, well, we sort of think like that, but not exactly anymore. And we've sort of changed our minds about X, Y, and Z. So when you read the second book, and I wouldn't say don't read the first book, do, but then make sure you read the second book so you understand what it is, what are the things that have changed over the time that we've been, been about. Yeah, marvellous. I think um, before I mentioned the disembodied kind of values because they're not really cultivated through habit formation, which I think is something that you guys do at Michaela. Mm -hmm. And you treat the uh, children as moral citizens, I would say, which is important, whereas um, other schools for, that I have seen do not, unfortunately. I was wondering, yeah. um, how do we encourage and guide pupils to be considerate, kind, and caring to each other in a manner that sort of binds them to a community um, more important than their own egotistical will or yeah. the obnoxious kind of fashions of the moment, as it were? Well, first you have to believe that that's what human beings do. Mm -hmm. uh, too often, um, I think we just think what you've just said, people would be outraged by and say, what do you mean? Children <laughs> are like that. They're all inherently good. And 
well they're not i mean they're human beings and yeah. and, and children are naughty and um they get up to all sorts of nonsense and that's why we love them um <laughs> and it's our role to try and help them become really good adults better human beings and so part of that is being grateful i'd say and being kind so um when you're grateful you're a happier person uh, and it doesn't matter how little you have because our children god knows they have very little some of them um, but you need to be grateful for what you've got because otherwise, it's what I said to you about my own father. He made me grateful for having that fridge, even though I thought, oh, I only have a hot plate. And it is human nature to think in the way that I did then, which was to go, oh, I haven't got as much as somebody else. Life is hard for me. And actually what you must always do is look to the person who has less than you and feel grateful for what you've got. So in order to instill that habit, you spoke about how we instill habits, that's key to a child's success because just doing a PSHE lesson on gratitude and getting them to move some bits of paper around won't teach, I mean, that won't do anything. You've got to make it part of your culture and you've got to make it something that is a habit forming so it becomes who they are. And so every time we have lunch, children stand up and give what we call appreciations and they speak out to a group of 180 children and they say, I'd like to thank my mom for waking me up this morning. And then we all say, what well, they say, on the count of two, one, two. And we all clap. And then somebody else stands up and says, I'd like to thank Mr. Smith for doing blah, blah, blah. You know, um, the fact is that um, uh, it, doing that daily gets them into the habit of thinking in a way that makes them grateful. And then our children are just lovely. They just become much nicer people. Um, then also the idea of being kind. So our, our motto is work hard, be kind. And uh, I mean, I have to say, we sort of stole that from KIPP in America, the charter school KIPP. They say work hard, be nice. We changed it to work hard, be kind. <laughs> it's a bit different. Um, and, you know, the guys who set up KIPP, they always said that, um, you know, if you can manage to get kids to do to those two things, to work hard and be kind, you really have accomplished a hell of a lot. And so, I mean, we've got extra things. We want them to be grateful. We want them to understand authority. We want them to do all sorts of other things, but those two basic things. So you encourage them to work hard through inspiring them and making them understand the sense of personal responsibility and why they're doing this and making something of their lives. And then the being kind bit, we're just constantly narrating it about being kind to each other. If, uh, if somebody drops a plate, for instance, in the uh, dining hall, uh, certainly at many of the schools I've seen, many schools I've worked, somebody drops a plate and all the children go, that, that, that is what happens. Uh, now, that might not be the case in all schools, but certainly in more challenging schools, that is what happens. Um, at our school, somebody drops something, all the children rush to help them pick it up. Now, um, you know, I say that, and I know people say, well, that's obviously normal, that's what happens. That has not been my experience, and certainly my teachers would tell you that the schools that they've worked in, that is not what we have seen. Now, we've all worked, uh, vast majority of us have worked in uh, uh, schools with challenging intakes. Um, I don't know what it's like to work in a private school. You know, if, you're, if your intake is selective in some kind of way, then you won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that has been my entire life. And, and I've spent my life, I mean, it's not just working in the schools I've worked in, I've visited hundreds, if not, well, I won't have visited thousands, but I've, I've visited more than a hundred schools in my lifetime easily. So hundreds of schools, uh, and not just in Britain, you know, in um, America, in California, in New York, in Brazil, in Jamaica, in uh, Trinidad, in, uh, in India, in China, in, in um, South Africa. I worked for a summer, for a whole summer working in a school. I mean, you know, I, 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 I am obsessed with education. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've spent a lifetime building up a, a certain amount of knowledge about it. Um, and, you know, what I would say to people who don't trust what I say or think, oh gosh, I'm not sure I like her. I would just ask you to judge me on my record. You know, I've spent over 20 years always working with children who come from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, I do, I've done so at great cost to myself. Um, I've dedicated myself to opening up the school despite the fact that it has given me untold nightmares. Um, and, you know, personal cost where people have attacked me and vilified me and, 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 and uh, you know, protests outside the school and calling me names and all sorts of horrible things. So if I've done all of that and I'm still in my seven o'clock SLT meeting every morning um, and I'm in my school every single day, I'm not, you know, one of these people who goes around drinking champagne and doing all those kind of things that sometimes some head teachers do. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't. Um, now people might say, but you would go on TV. Yeah, okay. So I go on TV. It takes me five minutes. I mean, who cares? I mean, like, I can do that and be in school every day. I mean, and, and I don't take the time off school to do any of that stuff ever. It's never happened. So, um, you know, I just, I would just say to them, look, just judge me by what I've done. It's my whole life. Over 20 years I have spent doing this. I must do it because I love these kids. You know, when I gave my speech at the Conservative Party conference, people said, well, she obviously wants to be a politician. Well, am I a politician? No. <laughs> people said, well, she obviously wants X, Y, and Z. Am I X, Y, and Z? No, I'm in school. I've been in school every day since I was 23. So, <laughs> you know, you, you got to judge me on my record. Um, in fact, I'm very unlike many people who are out there commenting. I am not a talking head. I am somebody who is a headmistress who's at the front line every single day, supporting my teachers um, and believing in something. And you might disagree with me, but the fact is that you cannot accuse me of hypocrisy and you cannot accuse me of doing this for some kind of personal benefit because this has not benefited me personally. Um, as I say, I've done this at great cost to myself, but it is because I love these children. I love education. And I want to have, I want us all here and all of us at Michaela to have impact on the wider educational world so that uh, people can learn from what we do here. And so that those underprivileged children who I will never meet will have a better chance at life. Magnificent. Um, I think another major virtue that you offer is your skepticism of smartphones and the invasive nature of technology. I was wondering, yeah. um, if you could speak about that and the importance of things like reading in a technological age as well. In a technology, sorry, the last bit I didn't catch. The importance of reading in our increasingly technological age and um, the cult of the smartphone as it were if that makes sense yeah okay well look i'm very much against smart smartphones why because i watch the smartphones destroy the, my children's lives so uh it destroys their lives one it breaks their brain they can't concentrate they're unable to follow the narrative of the story because there's beep 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 that goes on all sorts of studies have been done on this they use red for instance as the color that shows you your notifications because it psychologically makes you go oh my goodness i've got to check somebody likes me um they are unable to see life normally, so they don't interact with each other. It's all on social media. Uh, girls of 12 are putting on lipstick and pushing their bottoms out and making themselves look like they're 18. Um, I always say to parents, you have no idea who's contacting your child. They know people, everybody out there knows where your child lives, knows who their friends are, knows their route to school, knows the things they enjoy doing, uh, knows their name, can then develop a relationship. We once even had a situation at school where there was a pedophile uh, one of our 12-year-olds telling her about how he's coming out of the shower and all sorts. Mother didn't know. Well, how was she meant to know? Other situations where boys get involved, gang members and so on. I mean, uh, I, I could go, I have a list as long as my arm of, of, of real safeguarding issues that are creative because of the smartphone. But then aside from that, there's then just um, the business of uh, not being able to do your work. You're on your smartphone all the time. Some of our children are on the phone for seven hours a night. Well, so they can leave school. That means from the moment they leave school until they go to sleep, they're on the phone. And then some parents try and take it away. They wake up in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. and they're on their phone for two hours. Parents have no idea. Um, it is really damaging. And the key thing I would say to everyone is, look, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, all of these big CEOs who are flying around in their private jets, they do so off the back of us and our ignorance and when we spend our money on Instagram and Snapchat and so on, they, um, they just add on these phones. I mean, they, they don't. So when Steve Jobs was asked in 2010 what he thought of the iPad, he um, said, well, uh, not what he thought, what, the ch what his children thought of the iPad. His, he said, well, obviously my children don't know the iPad. I'd never give them the iPad. Uh, Bill Gates had a limit. He, wouldn't, he didn't give them to 16, his children data on their phones. Many of the tech CEOs don't give their children phones at all. These guys know the damage that it's doing to their brains, okay? They know it. And because they know it, it's their field. Just like I know education, they know tech. <laughs> and so, well, why do we think they're protecting their own children? Because they know stuff we don't know. Um, although actually we could know it if we were to read the studies, but we don't. And parents don't realize, they buy their child a phone because they think, well, it's good for them, why not? Um, my whole thing is unsupervised access to the internet. Yes, you can do maths games on there. Yes, you can do chess and so on. And if you're sat there with your child, playing chess on the phone. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. You can also, we set homework online. So Hegarty Maths is what we do. Every night our children do it for homework and it's online. So I'm not saying all that's online is bad. 
I'm not some kind of tech folk. But if you aren't watching your child, so what we say to them is, make sure that the screen is facing you when they're doing their Hegarty homework. Because otherwise what happens is you walk into the room and they maximize Hegarty. You walk out of the room, they minimize Hegarty and maximize Snapchat, you know? And the parents don't realize. So you've got to, what I'm always trying to suggest to parents is you're cooking, you're keeping an eye out, and you, you, you know, your, your child, you can see the screen and you're looking every now and again to make sure they're still doing their work. Um, it, it's really hard being a parent, really, really hard. Because especially in this technological age, because um, that technology is so damaging and so awful. And I really think that um, schools should use it as little as possible, frankly. I mean, so use it where it works. Mm -hmm. So we use it for the maths homework because it really works. We, we use it sparingly. I mean, no, we use it with staff. We use our phones. In, we communicate by phone all the time. That's how we communicate with each other in school. We go to the back of the classrooms. We do observations. We type it out on our phones, send it to the teacher immediately. Um, there's an, an immediacy that technology allows us. Uh, but the kids, hardly, hardly ever. We're hardly using, uh, and that is because um, we've made the decision to use technology where it works. Mm -hmm. And sadly, I think, because technology is a bit of a shiny thing, people then just introduce technology because they think, oh, wow, this is, this is technology. But you've got to ask, well, what's the end goal? Does technology actually improve this for you? Well, if it doesn't, then don't use it. Excellent. Um, I also think of the the virtue of your recent book, so Michaela, The Power of Culture. Um, the title kind of reminded me of one of my favorite authors, Thomas Sowell, and speaks to uh, virtue of Michaela, I think. Um, can you tell us what you mean by culture here and its power? Well, it's all about power <laughs> and culture. I mean, um, I should say it's all about the power of culture. I mean, uh, Okay, so in any organization, not just uh, schools, there is a culture to that organization. And that culture, if you don't try and frame that culture, it will be framed for you. Um, because that, that is just the nature of culture. And you'll know the expression, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You could have all of the strategies in the world, but if you don't have the right kind of culture, it doesn't matter. So you've got to, as a leader in any organization, want to frame your culture and be in charge of it and have impact on it. And I do that very much here. Our culture here is um, a relatively old school one, as you can imagine, but um, I mean, you'd have to read the book to really understand what I mean. But uh, we believe in things like duty, a sense of duty to others and to your community. We believe in personal responsibility. We believe in a sense of honor. You know, you believe, you, you behave in an honorable way. Because why? Because you want to be honorable, not because you're gonna get something out of it. Um, we have very high trust at this school uh, where the staff trust each other and, and line managers trust, you know, it's all, it, it all cascades down. I mean, we're all trusting each other. I have a duty to the staff to behave in a certain way. And my chapter in there is about servant leadership and about um, why I do what I do, how I lead uh, and what I owe to the staff. And they then owe something back to me, which is to give their best in the classroom. It's sort of like what I was talking about with regard to my father and with regard to families. You know, your, your parents give you everything, so you owe something to them, just like they owe to you. Their role as parent meant that they had a duty towards you to be a certain kind of parent and look after you. And then your role as child means that you then have a duty to them. So my father's now in his 80s, getting older and older. My sister does so much to look after him. I mean, I'm not in Toronto, but I'm Skyping every day. And that is because I'm his daughter and I owe him something. And, I, and he's now old and he depends on us. And that is that, is that cycle. And it's the same thing with my staff. I owe them something as their leader and they owe me something as the teachers in the school. And they owe the children. It's all, it's all part of one. So, um... It, it's hard. I can't really explain it. I mean, the book needs to, to explain our culture here. Mm -hmm. um, but you, what I would say, you know, you might not want the culture we've got, you, but you've got to choose what kind of culture you want, and then you've got to embed it. And then you've got to keep talking about it all of the time, repetition, um, so that people really understand what the school's about. I think too often in schools, you ask people, what's the vision for the school? People wouldn't be able to tell you. Oh, what's your motto? People can't tell you. Um, what's your... Um, I don't know, what, yeah, what is, your, what is your goal for the kids? What do you do? Why do you come in every day? People can't tell you. Uh, now, if you went around Michaela and asked them, they might not all come up with the exact same phrase, but they would essentially say the same thing. And I know that. I, I, I guarantee you, 100% of the staff here 
even the caretakers and the kitchen staff, I meet with them, you know, because I, I bring them into the culture, you know, a couple of, I don't know, once a term or so, I meet with them and I bring them all together. I talk about the culture at the school so they can, so that they understand what we do because they're all part of it. We all have a role to play. Yeah, marvellous. I think um, from a Christian perspective, the culture at Michaela is a lot more in line with what I would say rather than say the new dogmas of critical theory, for example, which I think is kind of Marxian in its assumptions. Um, I was wondering um, what are some of the important ways we might resist the um, kind of dogmas of critical theory, as it were, to teach children from, say, the inner city about Shakespeare and other greats through the ages rather than just collapsing it into Shakespeare, white man, you know, he's, he's yeah. not good, blah, 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 you know. Um, why right. do you value national identity, for example, so much and make that more central than these new social constructs like race or gender and things like that? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and you would read about that in the book, that we believe very much in our country and that we're all British, whatever colour we are. We <laughs> sing God Save the Queen and I vow to be my country in Jerusalem. And we do that because... Um, it is important that all of our children feel like they belong. And because of my own upbringing, having been brought up in Canada and then coming here and so on, I know what it's like and not being white, it, you know, uh, black, black people, brown people, whatever, you know, they, we can all feel like we're not, um, we don't belong to our country. Often because I think we're told we don't belong. Um, we're told by our teachers who think that they're doing a, a, a nice thing by telling us, oh, where are you from? Oh, you're from Jamaica. Isn't that exciting? Let's celebrate Jamaica Day. When in <laughs> fact, if you're not, you're British. Your parents are from Jamaica, and that's great. And you can also feel an affinity to, I feel an affinity to Jamaica and to Guyana, absolutely. And I've been to both countries. I've been to Jamaica many, many times. Um, you know, I know my rice and peas and my plantain and so on. I mean, I, obviously, uh, I, 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 I am Jamaican, but I'm also British. And if, if I can only identify with where I've come from or my parents have come from, as opposed to feeling like I am British, that is a great disadvantage in life. Um, and I think it's the role of schools to socialize children into um, feeling part of their country. And we do that very much here. When, we, when England was playing in the World Cup, you know, I could run and get another photo I got up on the, uh, over there of, um, of when England was playing in the World Cup. And, um, and that's because we had flags everywhere, St. George's flag. And I'm like, I care about football. I don't care about football. But it was a great opportunity for us to say, did we win? What were the great goals last night? You know, this is us. We are together. You know, I mean, this is England. And um, I don't think other, other schools do that as much. And I think that often ethnic minority children suffer the most in that because they don't really know where they belong. And mm -hmm. that is I know from my own personal experience that is a disadvantage in life to not feel like you don't belong to your country. Mm. As a Christian too, I find this um, kind of ritualistic teaching of history centered on say what I would call social constructs like race, so-called um, to be a kind of crude and dan dangerous perversion of Christianity. So obviously the great young scholar Coleman Hughes addressed this in the Rubin Report and how certain times in history are made sacred, as it were, and told over and over again to children to get them to dwell on their status as a victim. Yeah. And um, it's in this kind of Marxian oppressed oppressor dichotomy of history, and it's yes. the, the ferment this kind of race consciousness, like the old class consciousness or something. Yes. But um, I think the way you guys teach history is much healthier, and true history seems to show that such dichotomies and identities are shallow and unjustly divisive. I would think um, yeah. the fact well, that you- that's what you were saying. You're saying that the way in which history is often taught is to make children feel like they are victims and to uh, really stress how awful life was for, you know, and they talk about black history. And no, you can teach uh, British history, which involves black people, <laughs> whether it's um, the Caribbean soldiers who fought in the wars or whether it's uh, slavery or whether, you know, you talk about colonialism and Gandhi, you know, the, the, there's a whole variety of ways in which um, ethnic minorities are involved in British history and they used to be whitewashed out of it and that was wrong and it's great now that they are part of that of our history but it's our history there isn't British history and black history that distinction is 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 is, is wrong it's, it's one it's just wrong I mean it just is wrong but two it's also just morally wrong and it undermines ethnic minority children so um yeah I mean it's funny because um you know, people often say we're, we are a secular school, but I was once introduced at a Catholic schools conference as the um, most Catholic 
school head they knew who wasn't Catholic or more Catholic than <laughs> some of the Catholic heads, you know. I mean, and, and our school is very Christian-like in that way, even mm -hmm. though we aren't, um, we are a secular school. Um, and we believe in those values that you would find in abundance in, in the Bible, essentially. Uh, and, you know, I believe in, in, the, in, in what Jesus taught. Uh, about forgiveness and about uh, truth, believing in truth. That's the biggest thing. Um, we believe that there is a truth, you know, one truth. <laughs> and uh, I think too often the progressive doesn't. They reject that idea of truth. I believe there is a difference between right and wrong. And I believe that teachers should teach the difference between right and wrong. I think um, another good thing is that you teach things like the Irish famine. So being brought up from Northern Ireland, you are taught that kind of ritualistic were oppressed history as well as a Catholic sort of nationalist upbringing. Um, and it, it's in that kind of strange tribal dichotomy. It's only since I became a Christian as an adult and started to actually research logic and stuff like traditional methods of teaching logic that I've started to see the fallacies in it, the yeah. theological problems in it and so on. Um, yeah. I think this is important as anyone with a decent knowledge of history too would know that places like Ireland were colonized or oppressed that it don't tend to use those terms by other so-called white people and yes. um, it reflects the sorry history of many African countries if it starts the history more than a uh, other European countries or whatever so I, I would actually see this um, kind of critical theory as a kind of cultural imperialism ironically enough that it's kind of yes. so my, my, my um, fiance is from Zimbabwe so now her history is being rewritten as BM, for example, and my history is now being rewritten as Irish rather than predominantly Christian and, or as white rather than predominantly Christian and Irish, if that makes sense, yeah, which yeah. is crazy to me. But um, I was just going to ask you about this, this notion of BM. Uh, does that get under your, <laughs> on your yeah. nerves too? <laughs> yes, as your fiance from Zimbabwe, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean, look, to, to a certain extent, I understand it because mm. um, there are experiences of racism in a white society that your fiance and I, for instance, might be able to talk and, and understand each other. We would understand certain experiences that she would have and I've had, and we would get it right away in a way that you perhaps wouldn't, you know, because you might not have had those experiences, especially we're women, we're black women, we would have certain experiences. However, uh, there's loads that make it so that we're very different. She's from Zimbabwe. I'm not. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it means that there's whole m m huge numbers of things. I'm a teacher. She's not, or perhaps she is, but I mean, the fact is, you know, there are all sorts of things that make her who she is that have nothing to do with her race. And the problem with Bane is that it, um, it just reduces us to this kind of, well, you're all brown people together. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, we're not. I mean, there's an element of truth in there. There is an element. Um, and I have to say, in all of the progressive stances, there's always an element of truth, right? Mm -hmm. There is always. Mm -hmm. uh, why did they become progressive in the first place? Why didn't they start just keep with traditional teaching? Because some of that traditional teaching was really boring. And so they had to move to um, something a bit more progressive. And the progressives did actually contribute something quite worthwhile uh, with the behavior. Why don't they like the sense of authority? Well because sometimes that authority can be abused and that is a problem. And so they then wanted to remove that authority, but they go too far, that's the problem. So there's always an element of truth in what they're criticizing and what, they're, what they then react to. It's just that their reaction is too excessive. Um, and the BAME thing, look, I mean, it's, I, I kind of get it, I get it. And I quite like it as a term because it's short on Twitter when you <laughs> write a tweet, but, but I also hate it because of the reasons that you said. Um, having said that, when you want to talk about race, you want to talk about racism and you want to be able to make a point about it, um, it can be a useful term to make that point. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose I'm in two minds about it. Mm, I think um, there's an article about it by Jonathan Church where he talks about the fallacy of um, reification where you make whiteness the central thing rather than say pe prejudice. So being from Northern Ireland, you would experience those things that say you or my fiance would experience along color lines. You would experience that in religious terms. It's not as obvious uh, visually, but once they find it, say you had a, Christi a Catholic cross or something on, then that's, that's you. you you're, yeah. you're the enemy as it were, or you experience those things. And then you've got the sy systemic sort of um, racism that they've redefined 
yes. kind of um, to include everything that can't be seen or whatever. So he talks about that in his article, but I'm not yeah. sure too much now. I just wanted to say that I think that um, it's important for people like yourself to show nuance and teach history in that universal way, I think, because it frees us from a, that oppression Olympics, as it were. And um, it reminds me of the Solzhenitsyn quote where he says that the line between good and evil cuts across every human heart, as it were. Um, so thanks for your, your, the way you teach history is important. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so even though Michaela is not an explicitly Christian school, as you say, you treat Christianity in a more integral manner that many state schools don't today. How do you do this and why is it so important? I think of, um, say, going beyond religious education as it's now defined into areas like literature or history. So you, you couldn't understand Shakespeare without his references for the, to the Bible and so forth. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? You cut a bit, so I didn't hear the entire question. So oh, sorry. Have... So um, I was wondering about the way the integral manage, manner of teaching history, say its importance for literature, for example, whenever you would teach Shakespeare. For, to, to understand Shakespeare, you would have to understand the, the Christian oh, view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our curriculum does. So the English and uh, humanities departments talk very much, and they we have built our curriculum so that it fits together. In fact, we teach about the American civil rights, for instance, through um, the English department, not through the history department, uh, because they're looking at speeches and Malcolm X and um, Martin Luther King and so on. And so it just worked better to have civil rights taught there. So we, um, we do very much want them to have a chronology and to have a real understanding of the world. They're not just doing random topics. Uh, it, it, it all builds up. So they have an understanding of chronology and of the, the, the of history, of real history, which, um, which if you see things through a kind of identity politics uh, lens, you think to yourself, oh, we must do something on Rosa Parks, or we must do something on slavery, or we must, and that's not, we don't, we don't do it like that. We think, we teach British history chronologically, um, so that uh, they not only feel that they, in terms of God Save the Queen, belong to their country, but they really understand the history of their country. Beautiful. And um, just before we close up then, a, <laughs> is there anything that you're working on now at the moment or anything that you feel the passion to get involved with in the future? Do you like to tell us about I mean, We're going to expand the school. You know, we're going to open up a second school in 2023. We're opening up uh, Stevenage um, and then we'll open up another school after that. Um, I'm just excited about trying to make a difference in education and inspiring other teachers to, to do some of the things that we do. Wonderful. Thanks very much for joining me today, Catherine. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Mark. All right. Bye-bye.